All right, everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for the uh, second installation of our Conservation Career Series. And we've got a very special guest this morning, Christopher Howard, who is going to be sharing with you all about his career in um, fishery sciences and marine sciences. So um, we are going to wait just a second for everyone to file in. And as is customary for events that are hosted by Georgia Audubon, um, even though this series spans all different kinds of animals, all different kinds of wildlife and many different kinds of conservation, we have to ask about the birds. Um, so as you're filing in, please feel free to, in the chat, share where you're joining from. And one thing that I have been asking folks recently is if a bird could capture what you're feeling like right now, which bird would that be? So go ahead and um, throw in the chat um, of the birds that you know about, whether it's the little red birds, the cardinals outside, or maybe you like robins. Um, where are you calling from? And what bird kind of captures what you're feeling like today? I'm glad to have you all here today. We got Atlanta in the house, very awesome. Vulture, okay, I like that, I like that. Vultures don't get a whole lot of love, so I love when uh, <laughs> they can get recognized. Welcome everybody. Um, we're gonna wait just a couple of minutes to get started to allow people to join. Um, and then we will jump right in. Uh, Laura's calling from New York City. Uh, feels like a blue jay. That's also a great answer. Um, blue jays are actually my favorite bird, so that's wonderful. We got someone from Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, feels like a wren because I'm jumping all over the place today. That's a, re that's a really good bird to capture that uh, kind of energy. Absolutely. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. So we are going to go ahead and jump in. Um, Kiana's been like a nut hatch. <laughs> love it. Absolutely love it. All righty. Um, hello from central Minnesota. So glad you're here with us. Um, all right, so without further ado, we are going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, so as I mentioned today, we are joined by Christopher Howard, um, who is a Georgia resident, and he's living down in southern Georgia currently. Um, and he's currently enrolled and actually about to finish his master's degree um, at Savannah State University, where he is currently studying the effect of bycatch reduction on the harvest of blue crabs. And if that's, those are a lot of words you haven't heard of before, Chris will tell you all about it. Um, he also recently completed a Sea Grant Fellowship with the University of Georgia, where he was working at Graves Reef Marine Sanctuary, which you know we do actually have a marine sanctuary in Georgia, which is really cool, um, to develop a long-term science plan for this protected area. Um, and what Chris enjoys about the marine sciences is all the places that the field can take you. Um, Chris has had the opportunity to conduct research across the globe, including in places like Belize, Alaska, the Florida Keys, Costa Rica, and many, many more exciting places. Um, and we're very thrilled for him to share all of those with you. Um, Chris is also a co-organizer of Black and Marine Science Week, which is a, a yearly celebration hosted by the Black Marine Sciences Organization um, that celebrates Black people who are uh, conducting research and participating in the marine sciences and helps to uplift the next generation of young Black people who are interested in the field. And I will be putting the link to their website in the chat so that you can learn more about possibly connecting with Black and Marine Sciences, as well as supporting their efforts. Um, so I'm putting that link in the chat right now, and I encourage you to check it out. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Chris. Um, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. And everyone, as you're listening, if you have questions that come to your mind, and we encourage you to ask questions, we ask that you go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A function. And then at the end, Chris will um, answer your questions and be able to share with you as much information as we possibly can in the short time that we have. So Chris, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Karen. I'm happy to uh, happy to be here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Get ready for this uh, pr little presentation here. One second. And can you all see this? Okay. Yes. Great. So, uh, like Karina said, my name is Chris Howard. And I like to consider myself a fisheries biologist. And so as a fisheries biologist, uh, I pretty much uh, look at fish and their ecosystems and see how we can better just uh, conserve and protect uh, the environment and you know the fish and other marine life that live in this area. 
So a little bit about myself. Like she said, uh, I am a Georgia native. I grew up in Augusta, Georgia, where I lived. And that's where I think I got most interested in, you know, fisheries science. At the time, I didn't know it was fisheries science growing up as a little kid. I just knew I uh, loved fishing and loved being out in the water, whether it be, you know, kayaking, just going down to the river, swimming, things like that. And uh, actually, like one of my first science fair projects uh, back in like second grade was a, ended up being a fisheries project, even though I didn't know it at the time. It was a project looking at what bait would catch catfish better, whether it be like worms, bread, or chicken liver. So even at that young age, back in second grade, I feel like I always kind of knew what I wanted to do, even though I may not have really known how to get there at the time or what would lead me there. I knew that's doing something in science and doing something that had to do with fish in the water was definitely something I've always, always wanted to do. And uh, like you said, I'm currently finishing up my master's at Savannah State University. Uh, I'm working on that blue crab project, which I'm going to talk about in depth a little more later in the presentation. But before that, I did my undergrad at Thomas More University, uh, and I got that in biology with a concentration in marine science. And that school was located in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, actually. So it was a little weird leaving a state, you know, that has a beach and ocean to go to a landlocked state like Ohio to study uh, marine science. But uh, definitely in the end, I definitely think it helped me become a much more well-rounded scientist going somewhere in state and having no having you know both the influence from you know rivers and uh freshwater systems and also uh, studying the marine environment so uh one of the things that uh that i really enjoyed about uh, my time at thomas moore was being able to go to the thomas moore university field station and this field station was it was an old uh lock house so an old lock and dam that was converted into a research facility on the ohio river and uh what we would do there, um, it'd be a good opportunity for undergraduates to conduct, like, get research experience uh, throughout the school year. And then in the summer, they'd have uh, internship programs where you can come out uh, and they have different research projects for you to do to really get that hands on research experience, which is great. You want to get early as early as possible. So it was great to be able to do that as early as a freshman, which isn't super common uh, with some other universities. So, and uh, one of the projects that I worked primarily on at this field station, uh, at the field station, was doing these uh, fish surveys, and we'd use uh, gill nets and hoop nets. So the way a gill net works is it has a float with a lead line across the bottom, or an anchor, like you can kind of see here in this picture, and we go go in the river and set it across the river. And this is sort of like a non-discriminatory way to way to uh, catch fish and sample, you know, what's passing through. So we go and we drop these nets here in the water from like an hour or so, sit on the boat, wait it out. After that hour, we'd pull it up and see what kind of fish we catch. We didn't want to leave it into the water too long because, you know, too long stranded like that, hooked by the gills, it could harm the fish and kill the fish. And that's not something we we're looking really to try and do. We just wanted to get a snapshot of some of the fish, different fish species that are passing back and forth uh, throughout the river at that particular moment in time. So we'd pull it up and we, you know, count, you know, the number of fish we got starting off with there and then separating that number into the different species we catch. And that's where you want to get a good look at the, you know, the biodiversity of fish there. And we did the same with the hoop nets. Uh, we pit bait at the back of the hoop net. It'd be weighted and we throw it in the water. This we would actually leave overnight because it doesn't, although it holds the fish in the trap, it doesn't actually, it doesn't really harm them. So we leave this overnight, come in, and then you pull the hoop net up and see what kind of fish went in after that bait. And like I said, all this is done to try, to try and get a picture, uh, an idea of what your uh, biodiversity looks like within a within uh, any given uh, moment in time, because it's really just a snapshot. It can't give you you know, what fish are always coming through, just there when those nets are there. And what's important about biodiversity, you really want to have a lot of different types of, uh, of fish in the area at a time, because that just shows that the ecosystem is a lot more healthy. So when you hear people talk about biodiversity, the, the more biodiverse an area is, the really the better, because that means the ecosystem is a lot healthier. Um, and this was sort of, this is sort of an ongoing pro uh, project doing these things. This is one of the uh, 
intern projects you can do at the field station, but you also had uh, opportunities to do your own independent research, which is really good and I think was great uh, for young scientists because it gave you the opportunity to get experience like coming up with a research idea, writing a research plan, you know, writing down your methods, and then giving you the time to actually go and conduct your research. And then to you, it gave you a chance to conduct research on sort of a smaller budget because you, and sometimes in the sciences, you don't always have the, uh, the resources to do some of your big and grand research projects. So it kind of helped give you a little uh, reality check there that you can't just do whatever comes to your mind, but you can still get some really quality research done. And one of the, uh, and the project I did for my independent research was an electrofishing project. And uh, first, I'm going to give you an idea of what electrofishing is, is what it sounds like. Uh, you use uh, low frequency electricity, and it zaps the water, and it doesn't harm the fish at all. All it does is stun them, and then with their swim bladders, which is what fish use to stabilize themselves, that uh, makes the fish float up to the top. When they float up to the top, you scoop them, put them in a tub, and by the time they're in the tub, they're back, you know, swimming around again. So like I said, it doesn't really hurt them, but my project was looking at using different frequencies to sort of isolate uh, different fish in the water. So we're, what we were trying to do was isolate catfish out of the out of um, the Ohio River and only sample catfish because um, with the electrofishing, it's similar to the gill netting. It's not it's um, non discriminatory. It shocks everything, and it kind of when you're trying to just sample a particular fish, it makes it a little harder. We have everything coming up as opposed to just the fish you want. So with this project, like I said, we use different frequencies to sort of isolate uh, isolate um, a particular species. And we chose catfish because we thought that'd be maybe the easiest one where catfish are on the bottom, they have that really deep muscly body. It'd be easier to send different frequencies to, uh, to just shock them, not really affect some of your smaller and more uh, streamlined fishes that are swimming around down there. And the project did work. We uh, determined uh, what frequencies were used to better isolate uh, catfish. We couldn't di distinguish between particular species, whether that be you know something like a channel uh, catfish or a blue catfish or a flathead, but we were able to get to the point to where we'd shock and only catfish were coming up. So that was super exciting, not just for me, because like I said earlier, it just gave me the opportunity to have an idea, write a project and then do it, and then to see my idea actually worked was super, super exciting. And uh, after I graduated from Thomas More, I got a job, uh, a job at Orsenka, which is the Ohio River Valley Water Sanitation Commission as a contract biologist. And uh, what a contract biologist is, is um, they're not really hired on as full-time staff, but they're contracted out uh, by the organization. So I was really an independent contractor uh, conducting research. And I was hired on to <clears throat> help sample the full Ohio, Ohio River watershed. And the Ohio River runs from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, all the way down to Cairo, Illinois. And this is the entire watershed here. So that's all. And what a watershed is, is all those creeks and streams that feed and run into a larger river system. So all of this part of the highlighted map here, all of these streams and rivers uh, feed and run back into the Ohio River eventually. So like I said, we're sampling mainly on the Ohio River, but then there was also times where, you know, we felt the need and felt it important to go sample some of these smaller creeks that feed into this. And what Orsenka was is a pollution control agency. So we did this to kind of gauge the health of the Ohio River in terms of uh, pollution. And as a aquatic biologist and contract aquatic biologist, uh, we used uh, three different methods to test <clears throat> to test uh, pollution. We use fish as biological indicators here, and what we mean as biological indicators, like I mentioned before, we use uh, species composition to help uh, tell the health of the river. So what I said before about uh, having high biodiversity, you really do want high biodiversity, but it's when you break down your biodiversity, your different number of species, that can really tell you a lot about a lot about the river system. For example, if you're catching a lot of things like this picture here, long-nosed gar or lamprey or things like that that don't really need good water quality, and that's all you're catching, 
that's kind of a good idea that the water you're sampling in or the water you're in doesn't necessarily have the best the best uh, health. It's not because fish sort of like here, so the pot, uh, the American paddle fish, they're filter feeders and they need more pristine, really clean water to be able to survive and live. So what you want for a healthy river, you want a combination of these species like the gar, lamprey, things that can survive in uh, not very healthy areas or low salinity, or not salinity, uh, low oxygen areas or areas with poor nutrients. But you also wanna see a lot of these more upper level uh, species also that need the clean water because that shows again, just that the health of the ecosystem is a lot better. We have a wide variety of species that fit these different criteria. Uh, we had, in these criteria, like I said before, where we had species tolerant or pollution tolerant species like the gar, and then species intolerant like the paddlefish. And the way we sampled, again, was using electric fishing. And like I said, electric fishing doesn't really help, um, doesn't really hurt the fish. But we go up around, we had predetermined segments of the Ohio River. We'd go through, we'd shock the river, scoop up all the fish that came up. In this particular instance, we weren't trying to isolate any particular fish. We just shocked everything and scooped all the fish we could up, everything, including little minnows and darters that you can find in like creeks and things like that, up to huge catfish, huge gar, paddlefish, things like that. You just want to scoop everything that you can during the sampling period. And we do, we, you know, count, we count all the fish we caught. Sometimes it could be as little as, you know, in more of the poor areas, we'd catch about, you know, 15, 20, 30 fish in the 30 minute shocking area. And there's times we've caught, you know, four or 500 fish, including, you know, minnows and bass and things like that. We would count all those fish, uh, just split them up by species. And then based on that, you give the river a score or the section of the river score. And based on that score is what goes into our report to, the, to send back to the state to help them uh, gauge the health of the Ohio River. So um, also along with the uh, fish, I primarily work with fish, but I also help with the water chemistry and uh, vegetation surveys. And the vegetation surveys were similar to how the fish surveys work. Um, we use this here, a very high tech piece of equipment just a uh, garden rake head with a rope and a weight tied to it. We would throw that into the river and you pull it in and that those teeth of the garden rake will pull up any vegetation that's down there. And uh, we pull it up, we determine what kind of vegetation that is, whether it be something like, you know, milfoil or some other sort of uh, uh, aquatic vegetation. And similar to the fish, there are pollution tolerant, uh, more tolerant uh, plant species and more intolerant species. And we do the same thing where we'd, you know, pull it up, uh, composition that out. So get percentages of all of percentages of the sample that we have and give it a score based off of what types of vegetation were there. And then we'd also, uh, to get, we'd also take water samples and uh, water test and do different chemistry tests to, uh, see the health of the water. And we used all three of those things, the fish, the water, and the vegetation to come up with the composite score. Um, the score is being uh, excellent, uh, good, um, moderate, and poor. And we report this back with the state with our recommendations or areas that we think can be points, point sources of uh, pollution. And what a point source is, is areas where you can isolate, like uh, we think this is where the pollution is coming from. An example of that would be for uh, say a factory to have a pipe just pumping something nasty into the water. That can be an area we can like, hey, well, this is why we think your, this is why we think this section of the river is dirty because of this area here that's maybe pumping something bad in. And we can say that because we sample so much of the river, we can say that upriver of that area, the water is perfectly fine. Uh, we have great biodiversity, um, fishes, plants, the water chemistry came back fine. But then once we moved past that point, there weren't really many fish there. There were no plants or all the plants or fish that were there were super pollution uh, tolerant or the water chemistry was bad. So it kind of helps narrow down the areas where we think we can show, I think we can show where uh, some of that pollution is happening. And then after that, uh, I transitioned, 
I got the opportunity to be an Alaskan fisheries observer. And I saw a transition from that contract aquatic uh, biologist job. And there I was a ground fish bearing sea observer. And so uh, the ground fish species that I mostly worked with were the uh, pollock. So if you ever had a filet of fish from McDonald's, that's a uh, pollock and then uh, Atlantic cod. And as an observer, I lived aboard a fishing vessel like this one, the Pacific Explorer. This is the first boat I ever went on as a fishing observer. And we lived aboard that boat for three months at a time. And that's with the, uh, the fishermen. And on this particular boat, it is huge. I believe it was 150 feet long, but there was only five people on the boat, including myself and two captains, which kind of just hung up by themselves. So it was kind of, it was a really big boat, but there was not a lot of interaction with people while we were there, but it was a super fun time. And this is a picture of me here, uh, having second thoughts about jumping up and going to Alaska, being from Georgia and dealing with all the cold and snow and ice, but I made it through. And uh, this here, just a picture of some of the cool things that I saw. Uh, we saw an orca here off the side of the boat one day. Um, I was out there just, you know, looking at the water and an orca came up and swam up next to us. And uh, here is just a video. Here we're doing a uh, bag transfer. And what a bag transfer is, uh, we'd pull up, you know, a net full of fish. And sometimes we'd either go to a cannery and drop fish off there and they, you know, take all the fish off the boat and we'd watch them process things, the fish there and everything. But sometimes we'd pull up that net and then a processor, a catcher processor boat, where they have that whole processing canning area built into the boat themselves. We lean, we drag the net behind us in the water. Another boat would pull up alongside of us and throw a hook to it. They pull the net over and then drag it onto their boat. And we would do this because it really, you didn't have to go in as often for supplies. Uh, when doing, when working as an observer and doing the, uh, when you offload to a cannery, every time your boat's full of fish, you had to make the two or three day trip all the way back inland, offload your fish, make the two or three day trip back to the fishing grounds, fish again and keep doing that. So it kind of wastes a lot of time. So they do these at sea transfers sometime, it's when the, especially when the fishing is really good and you don't want to waste those days leaving the fishing grounds. Uh, you can have a transfer boat come up they take your catch and you just go right back to fishing the same day. So this here, just a video of one of the catcher uh, processors pulling up next to us and catching the bags. And with these big boats, they get super close to each other, which is kind of nerve wracking. And then all that bottom went down. That was definitely one of our calmer days out at sea during the winter. And I'll just uh, play that again. Yeah, so there was a lot of bobbing up and down, a lot of weaving all times, which was, I think was the craziest part about being on the boat. There were, there was no, I never realized how much I took for granted just being still and not moving, being able to sit a cup on the table and not worrying about it sliding off or having a plate of food and not worrying about it just staying in front of me. So that was really the biggest transition outside of the cold, just constantly moving all the time. So, and this is what that bag looks like here. We'd pull up a net full of fish and this net here, uh, it held about 30 to 35 tons of fish. And uh, which blew my mind when uh, they told us that, you know, each net held about 30, 30, 35 tons of fish. We put out a net. I'm like, all right, it'll be, you know, a few hours before this net is full. Cause we just, as an observer, we have to watch the net go out into the water and then watch the net come in and then uh, sample our catch, what I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. But the first time we put a net out, I'm like, all right, I'll have a few hours before this thing is full, I can go take a nap. I uh, saw them put the net out, chains got out of my uh, my float coat and all that gear they had me put on to go be on the back deck while you're out at sea. Get ready to take a nap. Before I could even close my eyes, I get a, they come to my room like, all right, Chris, the net's full. And it was only about 30 minutes. So it blew my mind the fact that I could catch, you know, 30 tons of fish in just 30 minutes, just dragging the net throughout the water. It was insane that it happened that way. So the uh, primary job as the Alaskan fisheries observer was first and foremost to ensure commercial fishermen follow the rules of uh, the particular fishery, which every boat I've been on, the uh, fishermen were super, super good with um, super good with following the rules. I mean, they know what they're supposed to be doing. They don't want to get fined. They don't want to get in trouble anyway. 
So that was a super easy part of the job. There was never any instance I had where I had to go tell someone, hey, you can't do this or stop doing that. So that was a super easy part of the job. We also had to sample and report catch. So anytime, like I said, we have to get out there when they're sending the net, being out there when they're pulling the net in, and then we have to sample this catch. And the way we sample the catch is you, you have these baskets that held about 80 pounds of fish. You just take a scoop, a random scoop. You do this three times, three random scoops of fish. You'd count how many fish were in the baskets. You would weigh, you'd weigh the uh, fish to get an average you know, weight per fish once you weigh them for the basket. And then there was also times where you did every, for example, every 15 fish that you touched, you would weigh that fish individually, measure that fish individually, and uh, and determine the sex of that fish individu individually. And you would do this to, again to get a species composition of the catch. They want to, it's uh, impractical to think, you know, you can do that and measure and weigh every fish to get an exact measurement. So by doing this randomly and taking all these averages, it kind of just gives you an estimate of, you know, how big the average fish they're catching is, um, whether it's male or female, whether how long that fish is, and about how many fish they're, many fish they're catching in that 30 ton net if we're doing all these samples. And uh, there were hundreds of other observers like me out there at the time. So with all of them doing this work, that's a huge amount of data that you're collecting. And you can actually get really good estimates on this. And then we would just report this catch data back to uh, Noah. And Noah, who manages uh, the fisheries here in the uh, US, you report the information back to them. And it really gave them real, real close to real time uh, fisheries management as you can get because you're required to do this every time a net went out and in you had about two hours to go and then about two hours to then go and report this information so it's as close to real time as uh, they could get also we were able to do a lot of um a lot of side projects while we were there uh and again our aging and then genetics projects we could uh if you elected to do that which i did uh Similar to with the, as a random sample, uh, you could take fin clips. So you just uh, take a fish, take a little clip of their, uh, of their fin, you measure, weigh, sex that fish, and uh, put that clip in a vial with a solution to keep it uh, fresh until you get back. And you'd keep, keep all that, and then they'd run, you know, genetics on the fish, just determine uh, if there's different stocks when you're fishing in different areas. And what a stock is, is um, that is just... Uh, a, a population of fish in a fishery. So you can have, for example, a Gulf Coast, Florida stock of like red snapper, but then you can also have like a Atlantic, off the North Carolina coast stock of red snapper. It's all the same species, but they're genetically different based on their location. And uh, we're fishing, we're fishing in both the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska, which are two different stocks. So they kind of want to see if there may be some intermixing between the Gulf of Alaska stocks and then the Bering Sea stocks, which is why they want to take these genetic uh, fin clips. Also, we got to do aging. Again, we take the links of the fish and then we'd cut through the back of the head or remove the otolith. The otolith of a fish is like the ear bone. And what you do with the otolith, similar to counting the rings on a tree, you can uh, cut, the otolith, cut the otolith down the middle and count the rings on the on the ear bone of that fish, and it'll tell you about how old that fish is. And why this is important is because you obviously have to kill the fish to do that, to see how old it is. But if we do this enough, again, uh, like with the averages, if you are doing this enough and have enough people doing this, you can eventually get to the point where you can say, okay, well, this fish is of this species and it's 21 inches. On average, that means this fish is eight years old, nine years old. So. For uh, other sampling uh, portion, you can you know, catch fish, measure them, and you can get an estimate of about how old that fish is without killing it. So you can measure that fish, get an age, and then release it back into the water in other uh, circumstances that isn't you know, a fishery. And then also another job we had to do, we had to watch the sorting in the factory. Uh, when we take this bag of net, we drop that into a refrigerated hole into the boat, we take that uh, to the cannery where we're not doing that at sea transfer 
And then we would, uh, they suck all the fish out of the boat. They go down a conveyor belt, which is where the, um, where the people that work in the cannery will sort the fish because with certain fisheries, like pollock, for example, you're not allowed to sort the catch at sea. Whatever you catch in the net is whatever you have to take to the cannery. So the sorting happens in that factory. And then after that, I uh, got my position at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary as the Sanctuary Program Specialist. And uh, Gray's Reef is one of 15 National Marine Sanctuaries. It's the one we have here in uh, Georgia. And Gray's Reef is about 20 miles off the coast of uh, Georgia. And it's a reef, but it's not your typical coral reef you may be thinking of. It is a live hard bottom reef. So there's rocks that have you know, algae, and they're still alive, but it's not coral. They don't have that hard uh, skeleton uh, like coral do. They are rocks that have different algaes and different uh, soft sponges and things like that that are built over the rocks. So they're considered still a living organism, but they're not a coral reef like what you may be used to, like in uh, the Florida Keys or in the, uh, at the Great Barrier Reef. It's a different type of reef. And uh, my primary job, primary job there, is um, was to write the the first formal grade reef uh, science plan. And why this science plan is important is because it gave you, uh, it would give other scientists an ability to see what sort of work needs to be done within the sanctuary, and uh, <clears throat> and things that the sanctuary knew was a priority and knew we wanted to get uh, done. So that way, people kind of weren't coming to the sanctuary to do projects that wouldn't necessarily benefit the conservation of Fraser Reef um, is what this was for. And then also we did a lot of acoustic telemetry and fish tagging, which is my favorite part. Uh, we were able to uh, catch fish, pit transmerge in them, and then with different uh, acoustic telemetry arrays, we were able to see where these fish were moving around, which was super, super exciting and cool to do. Uh, and this is a picture here of us on the boat. We were doing, <clears throat> inserting a transmitter into a fish here. Uh, what we would do is we set it up in this um, uh, uh, situation here uh, where there we'd put a tube of water into the fish's mouth so that we're able to still breathe throughout the entire thing. We'd make a small incision into the uh, belly of the fish, insert a super small about uh four centimeter, four to five centimeter uh, transmitter into the stomach of the fish, stitch it up, give it a few moments in a tank to get itself back together, get itself back from out of that stressful situation. And then we would release the fish. And again, like I said, we have different acoustic arrays or receivers that can detect when fish swim near, the fish with the transmitter swim near that array. And it gives you an idea of where fish are moving, how often they move, how far they go away from what we would consider to be their home uh, reef or home ledge. And uh, just get an idea of fish movement, which was another part of my job, which is to write the Gray's Reef Connectivity Report. And the idea of this report was to see how Gray's Reef connected to the rest of the Atlantic Ocean and uh, beyond. We did this um, with help from the De Decades of Detection Report. Uh, this, Acoustic telemetry project has been going on for about 10 years at Gray's Reef. And uh, based on some of the results on that, that's what sort of initiated the need for this report. Because after that decade of detection report came out, um, we saw there were fish coming from all over the place that was swimming through Gray's Reef. There were hammerhead sharks coming from the Bahamas that swam through Gray's Reef. There were Atlantic tuna that came down from Canada that went through Gray's Reef. Not only did these fish swim through Gray's Reef once, there was multiple years of them coming through the exact, almost the exact same route. So uh, it gave us the idea that a report really needs to be written because there's something about Gray's Reef that makes the fish want to uh, swim through this area. And we kind of want to know what that is, which is something that's still being worked out and written on now. And then, uh, also, after I finished that, and while I was writing my thesis, I helped on this uh, CFIS study with the Beaufort Laboratory in North Carolina. And the Beaufort Lab is a part of the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. 
And uh, what CFIS is, is the Southeast Fishery Independent Survey. And what they do is as an independent survey, it's fishery independent. So what I did as an Alaskan observer would be considered a fishery dependent uh, survey because it's dependent on the fisheries, dependent on what people are catching with the intention to sell. So it's a lot more targeted uh, sort of sampling because they're going to where they exactly know where the fish they want are. So which is also really good because, you know, you can get those species of interest, good sampling done. But then there's also fish that may not be of interest that aren't commercially viable fish that people don't necessarily want to eat. So that's where you get into these fishery independent surveys. And what uh, the CFA study did, we took chevron traps, this is what this trap is up here. It's just you put bait in it, throw it into the water and fish swim into it to eat the bait. It had a video camera attached. So the fish that you know don't wanna eat the bait, you can still capture fish on video. We drop that in the water uh, and get a presence absence is what we were looking at, just sort of to see what fish were there. Uh, it wasn't super important to us how many of a particular species was there, although we did keep track of that data. It was more important to see what, what different types of fish were coming through. And uh, the purpose of this study, we wanted to see which biotic and abiotic factors you know, had an influence on the community of fish in the Southeast Atlantic. So from North Carolina down to uh, Florida. And what I mean by biotic and abiotic factors, biotic factors are, you know, the biological factors, things like plants, vegetation, the coral reef. So in the marine environment, things like the habitat, you know, with the different ledges and nooks and crannies of the uh, reefs here. And then abiotic factors, so things like current, um, water temperature, salinity, just to see which of these factors, you know, really influenced uh, species and community composition of fishes. Because understanding this really helps when things begin to change, you can, it really helps uh, to know this as a fisheries uh, scientist or fisheries manager, because as things begin to change, you can go to get an estimation of why a particular fish may leave an area or why more fish may, a different species of fish may come in to an ecosystem under, when you understand how the factors affect uh, the fish community. So, uh, like I said, we're looking for patterns in fish biodiversity and uh, temperature, relief, and substrate were our primary factors of interest, especially with uh, climate change being a more uh, pressing issue every day. Uh, waters are indeed, the temperatures of the sea are indeed, you know, increasing. So that was our, the first thing we want to look at war was, is the warming waters allowing more tropical fish to come up from, you know, the Florida Keys up to, you know, North Carolina or from the Bahamas or, you know, the Caribbean, are these fish beginning to move and make that way upward? And that is actually indeed what, you know, we saw. We split all the fish we caught in these traps uh, into two categories, tropical or uh, non-tropical. What we consider fish to be tropical or fish that had a, had a uh, central center of distribution of about 10 degrees. So that's way down in the Caribbean is where 10 degrees latitude is. Uh, so any fish that where they primarily hang out in the Caribbean, we consider tropical and anything that was outside that range, we consider non-tropical. So uh, what we looked at from 2015 to 2019 was the amount, the percent uh, in, uh, increase of these two categories, so tropical or non-tropical. In Florida, the percent increase was only, you know, 28%, 0.8%, which makes sense that'd be pretty low because, you know, Florida is already more tropical water down with the key. It's really, this crystal clear water is very warm water, much warmer than, uh, much uh, warmer than about, much warmer than uh, Georgia, North Carolina. And these fish, they are showing up, that tropical fish are showing up in these areas a lot more. So get to my thesis project. The purpose of my thesis work here was to uh, determine if bycatch reduction devices, which are little plastic things that go over a funnel trap that keeps diving back terrapin out, which is this turtle here, which is the only estuarine turtle in uh, North America out of crab catch. If those excluders had any effect on blue crab catch here in Georgia, because you can see here in this picture, a lot of uh, terrapin go into the trap to eat the crab and fish and end up drowning because they 
need air to breathe. So we had uh, three trap types. Uh, these are what the excluders look like here. This orange one and this red one, and then the controls, one with no uh, BRD at all. We put these in the water to see if that had anything to do with how the number or size of crabs that were caught. Uh, we took the carapace length and width, so to get the size and uh, catch putting the effort. And what that is, is just how many crabs per hour we caught. This graph here has a lot of information on it, but I'm gonna really simplify it for you. It pretty much just shows that the size of blue crab wasn't any different with the excluders on, which is really good what we wanted to see, but the catch was uh, different. Uh, the one with no excluder caught a lot more than the two with excluders on, which wasn't uh, great, but can kind of be expected having something there sort of blocking the, sort of blocking the entrance, but it's still a good start. Um, still a good start because it did, they all did keep terrapin out. Uh, there was no trial where an excluder caught terrapin, but the control caught significantly more terrapin than the other two. Um, this was a lab study just showing the average number of blue crabs that passed uh, in that study, uh, the, which was unusual because the BRDA, the smaller red one, caught more crabs in the lab study than the one with no BRD at all. Uh, so as I wrap up here, I just want to talk about some just potential, you know, jobs and opportunities for people that may be thinking about going into marine science. I've done a little bit of everything from being, you know, field technicians like with, I was doing out at Senko and as a fisher observer, when you're out in the field, on the boat, in the water, doing things like that. But there's also people, you know, that don't like, that wanna do science, but don't necessarily want to, you know, be out in the water, be out in the mud and the cold. You, there's a lot of lab positions where we collect, you know, for example, with Senko, we collected water chemistry, but, you know, we gave it back to other people in the lab to do that tournament. They didn't have to, you know, step foot in the creek or in the water a river at all on a boat. And then just, you know, policy people, which is super important. Like what I did, you know, at uh, Gray's Reef. It was all policy. There wasn't, uh, I went on the boat because I liked being out in the water, but if I didn't want to, I could have just been at my desk, you know, writing reports and doing that important work there. So are there uh, any questions? Thank you so much, Chris. That was incredible. And what a, a very cool uh, career you've had so far. And we're definitely excited to see where you go. Um, and fishery science is such an interesting field because it's kind of the intersection of what we consume and how we use resources for eating, right? Our filet of fish at McDonald's and the science that helps to regulate and make sure we're doing it in a way that's you know sustainable, which hasn't been and in many ways isn't the case in a lot of places, unfortunately. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask you was, what is the importance of having the science in fisheries? Because um, you mentioned a lot of ways that you're doing science. You're measuring fish, you're tracking the sex of the fish that you're catching, all of these things. Why is that important in this realm of the way that we consume part of our, uh, our wildlife, essentially? Uh, yes. Uh, so like you said, just the biggest part is just to make sure we're fishing sustainably. You know, uh, we don't want to be taking too many fish from the environment to where the fishery will collapse and there won't be any fish left at all. Uh, and um, so that's really the biggest part. You wanna make sure that the amount of fish you're taking of a particular species, you aren't taking too many, which is why that the age and all that sexing stuff is really important because you can get maturity ages. So you can know, all right, well, this fish, particular fish, you know, they reach maturity in two years and they have a bunch of babies. So we can take more of that fish because the population is sort of replenishing itself more frequently as opposed to like a fish, like a rockfish that doesn't reach maturity for 30, 40 years. You can't, you know, take as many of those fish because it takes so much longer for them to be able to sort of replenish and replace those fish you do take because they don't, you know, have offspring as often. Right. So that's wow. really the big part, just, you know, making sure our fisheries remain sustainable so we have fish to keep catch, keep catching. Right. That's incredible. And it makes you appreciate those little fish sandwiches that we're eating to see how much work goes into making sure that we can have access to that resource. Thank you, Chris. Um, Leah asks, when a species is pollution intolerant, what does that mean exactly? And what is the impact? Um, so when uh, it just means that, um, so fish like people get stressed out 
if they aren't in the right environment. And some uh, species are just more uh, tolerant to being able to live in a poor environment. Uh, so like gar, for example, they can gulp air. They can go up to the surface and suck air, you know, like we do. They don't have to use their gills to breathe. So if they're in an area that's really just nasty and stagnant, not moving a lot, doesn't have a lot of oxygen in the water, they can just go up to the surface and suck air where a fish like a paddlefish can't do that. So that makes them more tolerant. And uh, where the pollution comes in, uh, pollution lowers ox like oxygen in the water because there's more bad bacteria and things that are dissolving, eating up that oxygen. So that's where the pollution part comes in. So that's uh, just one of the things that the pollution intolerant fish has that a pollution, you know, non-tolerant fish doesn't think just things like that. And each fish has different abilities, but I think the gars, I think the easiest thing to get with, like I said, they can gulp air. They don't have to, you know, be in the water at all the time. That is incredible. An air, directly air breathing <laughs> fish. Um, Serana asked, uh, can you further describe your experience at sea for months at a time, like day-to-day -day life? Uh, it was tough. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It was really fun just, you know, being in Alaska, seeing, I've never seen more bald eagles in my life. It was crazy. They were like, it was like seeing a pigeon. I feel like here, they were all over the place. But day-to-day uh, -day life, it was very, very boring on some boats. Like I said, there was only three people I could really interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. The captain was always so busy. Like I could go talk to him if I wanted to, but you always get the vibe. Like I'm too busy to just chit chat. <laughs> but uh, there was a lot of downtime when we weren't fishing. Those three days cruising back and forth. Uh, a lot of movies watched, books being read, going a little stir crazy <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but uh, the day to day, yeah, it's kind of boring. You can't really talk to people too much. Uh, they had a satellite phone on the boat, but it didn't really work too often. So it was a lot of days of sort of just being by yourself, like I said, watching movies or reading a book. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah. Hard to even imagine. And then the constant bobbing up and down, of course, that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, that was definitely the worst part, I think. <laughs> Not me want to be still. <laughs> that is unbelievable. Um, so Leah also asked, do you have any words of advice for the average consumer of marine products? And I wanted to make sure we got to this because this is important. Um, what should we consider when we're looking to get fish or sushi? Um, which is a, uh, those are both obviously common uh, food items that a lot of people consume. Uh, I would say uh, just look for those fish uh, products that are sustainably caught because not all uh, fish products and marine products you see in the store are sustainably caught. Um, that's not really a regulation that they can, they can be sold without being sustainable caught. Although stores are trying to move away from that just for, you know, optics, they want to show that, you know, we support sustainable fisheries. So a lot of stores themselves are kind of making the decision to only sell and market, you know, their sust like sustainable products. But yeah, just making sure that the stuff you do buy, and not only, you know, fish and sushi, a lot of, uh, you know, skincare, healthcare products, you know, that, that have like fish oils and things like that. And uh, same thing, just making sure that that stuff is sustainably sourced. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, the final question that we have from Laura, did invasive aquatic species impact any of your data and reporting? Um, in the Ohio River, yes, especially uh, the closer we got to the Mississippi River with the um, silver carp, which is an invasive uh, species of carp. It's in the news a lot. Uh, people are really worried about those being in the Great Lakes and things like that because they just, they're huge for one, and they take over an ecosystem. It's and crazy how fast they do it. They grow really fast. They have hundreds of thousands of offspring a year and uh, they just eat everything in their path. They don't eat other fish, but they eat a lot of the things that native fish need to survive. And uh, uh, another big issue with them is that native fish, since they're an invasive species, they don't know, like it's not a part of their diet. So even those gar other fish that eat you know, fish or eat, feed on fish. They don't know like, oh, this is something safe for me to eat because historically they just don't eat it, you know? So they're able to explode. And then too, they jump. There was a, the jumping carp 
So when you're driving by on your boat, they will jump in the water and one actually hit one of our supervisors in the nose and broke his nose. Cause they're like I said, they're, I wish I had a picture of them to show, but they're huge, like 30, 40 pound fish, you know, three, four feet long. And they easily get five, six feet out of the water jumping and they get spooked super easy. So that just the noise of the boat engine makes them jump and it's insane. Oh my gosh, this, I, now I'm going to have to go down a rabbit hole looking these uh, <laughs> fish up. That's incredible. Um, so everyone, we are right at time. Thank you all so much for coming and joining us, Chris. That was amazing and such an incredible look into the, the world that you've lived in so far and the beginning of your career. I want to encourage you all to, number one, follow Chris on Twitter and Instagram. I've put his handle in the chat. And again, uh, the organization that he's a part of and an organizer for is called Black and Marine Sciences. Um, and so if you want to learn more about this organization, please check it out. Um, and here at Georgia Audubon, we are a, an avian conservation organization centered on building places where birds and people thrive. Um, and as part of that, we have a resource page on our website, especially for young people, but for people of all ages who are interested in careers in conservation and different ways that you can plug in, get experience, have internships, have jobs. Um, so this, the third link that I've posted in the chat um, takes you to that resource resource page. So I would encourage you to check it out if you're interested. If you know young people who are interested in careers in wildlife sciences, encourage them to check it out. There are lots of opportunities around the Atlanta area and across Georgia and even across the country, um, including ones that uh, Chris described today. So Chris, again, thank you so much. We're so grateful. Um, and we hope that you all have a wonderful day. And we encourage you to reach out to Chris on social media if you have more questions for him. Um, Thank you all so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at the next installation of our conservation career series. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.